Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft sending cut and paste to Windows Phone 7. Sort of. Also, Verizon's going all Amazon on their sales numbers. Nokia is going to team up with Microsoft, maybe. And Mario is in your face. We'll tell you how next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, February 4th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now absolutely free at MailRoute.info. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Jason Howell. This is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, trying to make some sense of it. And this being a liquid Friday, we have a special guest with us, Stephen Johnson, A.K.A. Darth Weef from the New Brew Thursday podcast. Woo! Also, hey, the Lone Coder. The lone you don't coder. get as much uh, credit for that. Yeah, that's well, that's my company. That's my web development company. So, but I also do a ForTheLoveOfGeeks.com site where I do my geeky stuff over there. So, it's great to have you on the show. It's even better to have you bringing us all beer. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's he, what I do. I come with beer. <laughs> he brought so. us all beer based on what we had said it's beforehand. Like, yeah. That we, what kind of beer do you like? Mm -hmm. He was careful to get everybody their own beer. I've got a Midas Touch. Tom. I've got a, I've got a brown Dogfish Head Palo Santo. Because you Marone. said that you loved brown ale. And Jason, what have you got back there? I have Pliny the Elder. Ah, it's a good <laughs> one. It is delicious. Isn't that? It's it's just got a good label too. Yeah, it does. You know, it's simple. It's very basic. Effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kids at home, grab a root beer or an orange juice and join along <laughs> with right. us. It's Liquid Friday, so water is fine. Uh, exactly. Windows Phone 7 is getting its copy-paste update. Oh, my gosh. If you're a developer. Oh. <laughs> uh, on the PPC Geeks podcast, Brandon Watson, Microsoft's Director of Developer Relations, announced the company would be seeding a new version of Windows Phone developer tools to reg registered Windows Phone 7 developers today. So you should be seeing it if you are a developer uh, today. And it will include, among many other updates like performance improvements, the long-awaited copy-paste feature. You know, it's funny uh, because the copy-paste, like Windows Phone doesn't have copy-paste. It's one of those things that if you have it, it is indispensable. But I do think that people who don't have it don't know Live what they're... Live without it. Yeah, yeah, it's like if, you, if you've never used it, it you... You, you find ways to work around it. I was it fine with it not being on the iPhone. And then once they had it, I found reasons why I love it. Yeah. But it didn't change my life. So, yeah, you know, it's, I, it's, I think it's going to have the same effect. It's an annoyance, it, not, if a, right. not a blocker. If it were to be blocker, taken away right. from you, there would be an outrage. But the, I, that said, it's kind of ridiculous. The ridiculousness but. about this, though, is Windows Phone 7 came out in like late October, early November, and they haven't updated it. And they promised that this would have happened a long time ago. Well, yeah, they indicated it was going to happen. I promise, maybe being a bit harsh, they, but they, they, you know, in their Microsoft way, they liars. promised. <laughs> Promise is a very harsh word to use. It's a very system. strong <laughs> word. But they did indicate it would be coming in January. Right. We're, we're in February, and they're just giving it to developers to test. So there's no indication of when it's going to actually come to consumers. Verizon iPhone went on sale yesterday for Verizon subscribers as a pre-order and then sold out by 8, 10 p.m. Eastern time. They stopped taking the pre-orders. Now, I, so this is, obviously, there's a lot of interest. I mean, we can all agree that it's like, wow. I mean, the amount of time that it took for them to sell out is probably what's important here because no one can agree on how many units were actually yeah. sold. Verizon's going all Amazon and like, we we sold records amount of a, for us for a smartphone. So how many? Right. Records no amount. It smashed <laughs> records. It was totally unprecedented. It was unexpected. Are those I, enough numbers for you? <laughs> I feel like they are being honest about how pleased they are, but I think oh, it's yeah. because of the time that it took to yeah. sell out. RBC analyst Mike Abramsky estimates it was fewer than 100,000 units, which that wouldn't even pass the Droid. The Droid, the droid sold 100,000 in its first week. But I think the, the difference between this and the Droid is that the Droid took over a weekend to sell, and this took about 12 hours. Yeah, and that's I think that's why that's why they're making as big a deal about it as they are. Um, but yeah, I don't think they sold any more than what 
this guy is, because that makes sense. That's that seems to be their magic number for phones that they pre-release. And the uh, uh, and the terms for the subsidized version, it's two hundred dollars subsidized, are not terribly forgiving. You have to be twenty months into your twenty-four month contract to get the subsidized price. So if you're all of these pre-orders were for existing Verizon subscribers. Mm -hmm. right. If they weren't 20 months into their contract, they're going to have to pay 650 bucks for the 16 gigabyte or $750 for the 32 gigabyte. And gigabyte those are iPhone. steep, although I feel like a lot of these folks that are switching, I feel like the, the time that they've been with Verizon and are ready to switch is directly correlated with the interest for, for existing Verizon customers. I mean, 20 months is, okay, so you're like almost up on two years. You're ready for a new You've phone. You've put in your dues. You're ready for yeah. a new phone. Well, you, Samp, I don't know who they are, but they're one of these survey companies that, that they exist. They do surveys. Yeah, you can't walk down a street without stomping on two survey companies these days. 54% <laughs> uh, of Verizon's Android and BlackBerry users are indicating they will switch to iPhone. So it's no surprise they sold out of their of their allocated inventory in time. The question is, they they must have reserved some for sale on February 9th because that's when non-Verizon subscribers right. can pre-order. And their big interest is in getting those people to switch from their current provider to Verizon. Right. I have to say, though, I mean, the if you're not getting the subsidized deal and you're switching over and you're paying $750 or $650 for this phone, that seems like an awful lot for a phone that is more locked down than the the AT and T version. I mean, if I get an AT and T phone, I can unlock it. I can do what I need to. You can to use it on T Mobile, right? Well, but you, only on Edge. Right. Okay, but but with the Verizon phone, I can't even take it out of the country. Like it's you know it's limited to the U S. It's limited to the Verizon. Well, actually, I, I do think hardware. I, is it not a world phone? Can you not? You still use it? It doesn't have any other bands? Well, most of the other, the, the international I know, that, I know there's cellulars. no CDMA right. elsewhere, but does the Verizon iPhone not have GSM bands in it? I haven't. I, I, I haven't think it's a dual band. I think it's okay. just yeah, CDMA. Yeah. It's CDMA yeah. because yeah. that's why you can't use the dual uh, band. Uh, you're right, then. That's a, so, it's a real that's, limitation. To me, that's way too expensive for a phone that you only have access to in the United States. Although I did me read too. earlier that Verizon is willing to give you a loaner phone if you're going out of town for any extended nice. period of time when you get your Verizon iPhone. Here's what a phone you can use phone? somewhere else. Yes, it's a That's great question. convenient. Instead I of just carrying my phone, I stop by the Verizon office to right. pick up my loaner. Can yep. I just keep this one for the time? <laughs> That's like when Tech TV said, no, Tom, it's fine that you have a desktop. When you travel, we'll just give you a loaner laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, the the international issue is, I mean, it's a big deal to me. Right. It's a big deal to you. I think for a lot of people, they're not doing a lot of international travel. And when right. they are, maybe it's to go on vacation in Mexico or they, yeah, Hawaii or to the phone. Caribbean. <laughs> and you don't want to work because right. you're taking your two-week vacation. Yeah, you so might want to have your text messages. You might want to have your pictures. A lot of people may just not be Twitter. thinking about that. Yeah, right. You might want your Twitter and your Facebook and... But, but again, I think that we all think, well, isn't that a given? I mean, you'd want to check in. Maybe to some people, that's not such a big deal. It's not such a big trade-off. It's kind of interesting that um, of the existing Verizon users who said that they were interested in switching or very interested in switching, 66% uh, of BlackBerry users said that they would probably switch over. So it's mostly the BlackBerry. Yeah. I, would say, I wouldn't say mostly, but BlackBerry users more likely to More switch. likely to want to switch over to the iPhone. That actually makes case. sense. Yeah, and I think on my small little Twitter universe that I see, that's most of the people that I hear that are telling me that they're going to switch to the Verizon iPhone are black, current BlackBerry users. And I, I understand that. I mean, if I was a BlackBerry user, I'd be looking for any phone to get off, <laughs> get off BlackBerry. For. Some people have already received their uh, confirmation from Verizon uh, indicating that their Verizon iPhone would ship on December 7th or, or arrive on December 7th. That's three days before the date that it's actually supposed to arrive. February they're, 7th. They're supposed to arrive. I'm sorry, did I say December? Yes. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be waiting a long I, time for that phone. You've got all year. <laughs> just don't Winkle. hold Just your calm breath. yourself Is down. Is it February already? <laughs> yeah, February 7th. Uh, and it's supposed to come out February 10th. Right. So this happened with the iPhone 4 last summer some where some people, people got it early. Some people were surprised. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, all right. The other thing that's happening in the Verizon iPhone land, and I, and I promise you we only have two more stories and then we won't have more <laughs> Verizon iPhone the rest of the show. Uh, Verizon iPhone commercial is out from Verizon. We've seen the Apple one where they're celebrating the diversity, right? Like, oh, we have AT&T and Verizon. It's we're awesome. We're just friends with all. Here's Verizon's take on it. For the audio users, they're it's just beautiful. showing dramatic pictures of the iPhone. It's intelligent. Even genius. But does your network work? 
Yes, I can hear you now. This oh, is no, he largest did it. and most reliable wow. network. Droid does. <laughs> wait. Boom. <laughs> was the dynamite. People are going crazy over this commercial. I, I feel like um, it's a clever commercial, but I mean, yeah. that was Verizon's like tagline anyway. Right. They just tweaked it a little well, bit. Well, they would, they would have been foolish not to play up on the fact that AT&T is the most hated network in the world right now because of their iPhone problems. But AT&T has an answer. They are quietly sending notes to <laughs> AT&T iPhone users saying... You deserve to get the most out of your voice and data services wherever you are. And with the new AT&T 3G microcell, you'll get a quality signal with up to five bar coverage right in your home. To get your 3G microcell, please print and bring this email to an AT&T store or simply show this email on your smartphone or mobile device. AT&T 3G microcell at no charge. I would like to tell AT&T, <laughs> screw you! Yeah, amen. Thank you, Sarah Lane, for that. Thank you for I letting have, me vent. I've, I am so insulted by this. I am too. And I've been a customer since it was singular. And I had the, I've had every generation of iPhone, and I've dealt with the, the, the call issues, the drop calls, this and that, whatever. And I have to say, coming into San Francisco, it, I, I understand why you all complain about it, because it is absolutely unusable. In this and city. we do complain about it more than it warrants on a nationwide scale. Right, because in L.A., I don't really have a problem with my phone. I don't drop that many calls. There are calls. a lot of places yeah, in the country where they go, it's it. just not that bad. But it's like, you know, if they had done this six months ago when they found out that Verizon was going to get the iPhone, I would have had respect for it. But it's like, the message is, is screw you when you couldn't change. Now that you can, hey, stay with us. We're all friends. Here's a microcell. Let's, let's give you something that you should have had anyway exactly. for free. Exactly. And there are also some catches. So it's like, this sounds great, right? Okay, let you know, maybe I'll stay. AT&T has finally seen the air of their ways. Not really. So uh, for one, customers who want to accept the, it would be a $200 device, must stay on board with AT&T for another 12 months. <laughs> and additionally, you either it's have to... free. It's yeah, free. Right? It's free <laughs> as long as you don't go anywhere right. for a year. Uh, and you have to return the device to AT&T or pay for it at a prorated cost if you decide that after six months, it's not really that worth it. Then it hasn't really affected my... Screw nice. you! Yeah. <laughs> Once you decide it doesn't really affect your service ability and you decide you want to leave and go to Verizon, you're so, going to end up paying for it. I think, I mean, for some people who are like, well, I have no plans to leave AT&T, free microcell, sounds great. By the way, not everybody gets this offer. Only some people have reported to have gotten this email. I'm not one of the people who have gotten well, yeah, it. I've been I, haven't, I, haven't gotten, I haven't gotten two one years. either. And I've been an AT&T user for six so, and so I'm yeah, not that, really that's sure the other side that I'm a little bit offended about. <laughs> I wonder if Molly Wood got one. And maybe you just have to really complain a lot about it. Yeah. Or maybe you have to not complain that much. Maybe we've or maybe all complained well, then so I much that they one. say, screw you, <laughs> Maybe you just go into an AT&T store and say, hey, I've heard all about this thing. I'm ready to switch. Yeah. You going to give me one? It's you like the you secret menu. It might work. Go you'd, 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 you'd have to talk to a supervisor, right? You're not going to get it from the first person. But I bet if you bet if you wind it up and elevated it, yeah. That's not a bad idea. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsors, MailRoute. And may I encourage you to go to YouTube and search <laughs> MailRoute NSFW for the best <laughs> MailRoute commercial you it's will fantastic. ever see, far surpassing what I'm about to tell you. Um, it really should be their official ad. It really, it really <laughs> should. Although Tom Johnson of MailRoute emailed me and said, I, I said he doesn't want his mom to see it. But oh, well, there's that. <laughs> what okay. you should know is that MailRoute gets rid of spam. And if that sounds like crazy talk, I've tried it. It actually works. No false positives. Your mail gets filtered by them. They take away the spam. They leave in the good stuff. They send it back to you. If that sounds like something you want to investigate, try it out. MailRoute.info. Absolutely free. As a Twit user, you go to MailRoute.info instead of MailRoute.com. See, that's the little trick there. And uh, then not only do you get to try it for free, but you also get 10% off the lifetime of your account if you do sign up. It's $30 per year or $2 per user per month if you're a small business. And all you need to be able to do if you're running your own domain is edit the MX record or get somebody to do it for you and then you don't have any spam anymore check it out mailroute.info and we thank them for their support tom johnson's a great guy over there give it give, give it a look try it out and, and give a look at that youtube video it's so funny <laughs> unless you're his mom please watch <laughs> unless the you're, video unless you're Miss, mrs johnson <laughs> exactly uh so starting on monday uh some Nokia Microsoft murmurs began to rise. It began with Adnan Ahmad of Berenberg Bank in Hamburg, who urged Nokia to partner up with Microsoft. New York Times ran a story today saying since that story came out, the stock has risen 4%. 
on the idea that maybe this would happen. Now, next Friday is something called the Capital Markets event. It's a, it's a Nokia event. And Stephen Elop, former Microsoft executive, who is now the CEO of Nokia, will be speaking. And everybody's got their bets on what he's going to announce. And Gadget says they have a source who says... Nokia is going to announce that they're partnering with Microsoft and bringing Windows Phone 7 operating system to Nokia devices. Mary Jo Foley of ZDNet over on Twitter says not going to happen. Uh, so we got some varying opinions on here about whether Nokia is going to partner up with Microsoft or not. What do you guys think? Should they? Well, Bring they, Windows Phone 7 because Nokia has been known for the entire solution, right? Mm -hmm. We've got Symbian or Mego now, right. and we provide everything. Well, Nokia and Microsoft already have partnered up in the past. In 2009, they brought mobile office to Nokia phones. Uh, and it was, I don't know, it was helpful to some people, but it, it wasn't like an industry shaker. So it's not as if they haven't experimented with this sort of thing before. What's interesting is the speculation that Symbian may be dropped. You know, it's like if they decide to work with Windows Phone 7, somehow they can't just add that to the repertoire right. of what they, Nokia does. Right, they would just does. ditch everything. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see that happening either. So I understand why Mary Jo Foley is going, this just this doesn't make sense based on what they've invested in. However, having a former Microsoft guy running the show at Nokia and being able to forge new relationships and figure out how both companies can benefit because both companies... Are struggling mm -hmm. and, yeah. and want you, their platforms. Windows Phone 7 is not any great shakes right now. Right. It's, it's not failing, but it's struggling. But it's also a good operating system. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, they, I think Microsoft can benefit from Nokia and vice versa. I feel like this is Nokia's ploy to try to get some relevancy back. And they, they like, they, because I, I agree, Nokia has always had a very stable, very usable system. I think the Symbian and the Mebo are, they're, they're both very good. Um, and they're also very near and dear to Nokia's heart. So they, I, I agree with you. They're not going to give up those things. They're not going to let Microsoft say, oh, we're going to partner with you. Now you're Windows Phone 7. We're getting rid of Symbian. We're getting rid of, because they're, they're never going to agree to that. Um, but I really feel like this is a ploy that it's not going to happen, but they're using it to kind of get their name back in the news, get a little more relevancy in a market that's now shifting strictly over to the iPhone, over into the these the Windows 7 platform, and Nokia is feeling a little left, left out. Nokia is the leader in phones, but they've lost the lead in smartphones, right. and that is dangerous. That is something, mm -hmm. because smartphones is where everything is going, right. uh, and they, they need to recapture that fire. I, I think it would be a mistake for Nokia to try to compete as a device manufacturer with HTC Samsung. and Samsung mm -hmm. and all of them. I think that would be a huge mistake uh, for Nokia. The idea of Nokia opening up a little bit and saying, you know what, we're going to put a couple of, of Nokia phones out with Microsoft Windows Phone 7 as an experiment while we continue to develop Mego could actually prove to be very beneficial, especially if they do what you were talking about, Sarah, and they get Microsoft developing some software for Mego. Right. And providing some some expertise and help in popularizing that format. Because what Nokia was good at in 2004, when I last had a Nokia phone, <laughs> and I loved it. I did too. Nokia was, was my go-to phone the, for a long time. When I switched to the Motorola Razr, I was bereft because the interface was ridiculously awful. Nokia did interface well back then. Mm -hmm. The thing is, on a smartphone, they don't. They've fallen behind. And they, they, they need to hire a design company or maybe get some design expertise. I'm not sure if Microsoft's the place to go for that. Uh, but they, but I, I yeah. think it would be, I think Microsoft you're right. Microsoft doesn't I think it would scream be, UI. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, but, but look at who's in charge of Nokia. I mean, who else are they going to go to besides exactly. Microsoft? Because that's where all, that's, that's his knowledge well, I just, base. I feel like Nokia hasn't really known what to do with itself once they lost their black and white screen. You know, like they just they're 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 so used to that really small screen and the, the the idea of a big screen and actual interface, I think, kind of escapes them. Yeah, I, I was just going to say there was a lot of, of speculation after the earnings call that the CEO, Stephen Elop, he, what did he say here, said we must build, catalyze and or join a competitive ecosystem. Yes. He also said we must maintain competitive differentiation. In other words, it must be able to customize its platform so that Nokia phones still offer something unique. How do you do that on Windows 7? That's what I'm wondering. Because well, Windows 7 kind of locks down how you present it. You do it by offering a couple of Windows 7 phones, but not just becoming a device manufacturer. Right. So you experiment and you see 
if for some reason those phones are are hot off the presses, then maybe you rethink your strategy. But mm -hmm. you don't just choose. Well, I think that you Nokia expand. needs to get in bed with somebody to help them out, <laughs> and you know, in the Nokia in the, in the most family safe way. <laughs> Nokia needs a dinner? significant other, right? Um, but I don't think Microsoft is the right person. This I think I think Google turning into would an be episode better. of the Golden Girls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I no, think old man Microsoft is luring Nokia into their bed. <laughs> Nokia being played by Rue McConaughey. I'll take anyone. I'm old. Yeah, uh, I can't get that young whippersnapper Android to play with me. But. Oh, wow, I just had a really bad image of Sophia in my head. Uh, but no, I think Google would be a better choice for that because I think that Google yeah. is going to have a, a more up-to-date, fresh viewpoint on this than Microsoft is. All right, uh, let's move on to Cyber War Rules of Engagement. The East-West Institute uh, is presenting proposals today, probably already presented them at this point, for the cyberspace equivalent of the Geneva Convention. This is at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, and they're saying we need to figure out what the rules of engagement are in cyberspace because we've had Stuxnet. We've had attacks on Estonia. We have had government involved in cyber attacks. And essentially they want, they want to set the rules of engagement, like don't attack hospitals, don't attack essential services, you know, don't don't attack non-combatants, in other words. I, I don't think that this is going to really, and I, obviously Darren would be a much better uh, voice for this, this aspect. Darren but I Kitchen. Think, um, you know, I used to be very into this computer security uh, realm back in the day. Um, I'm not really as into it anymore, but a lot of the hackers that I have had contact with and those the people that are in that realm, um, their whole point is they want an anarchist situation. They want to create chaos. They want to, you know, and not so much that they want to kill people by taking down hospitals, but they do want to take down essential services in those instances. Well, and that's a really good point because the governments can say, well, let's play nice. Here are the rules of engagement. But it's not just about, okay, well, we're going to play nice and anybody who didn't sign on to the Geneva Convention will ostracize and put pressure on. You've got, I mean, you think there's a problem with, you know, non-lateral conflicts in physical space with terrorist groups. It's innumerable with the amount of hackers you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, it's like there's not a lot of gentleman agreements going well, yeah, on in cyber espionage. Yeah. It's let's, like, you don't want me to realistic. do this? Watch this. Yeah, let's be realistic. This is not a war. This is this is hacking in this sense is a crime. So it's like telling a a murderer, don't kill women, don't kill kids, you know, just kill guy, kill men, you well, know, like you can't you can't set those kind of rules for people who are not following rules. I th I, and I, and I, I, you know, it would be one thing if you said, okay, governments, you are official hackers who are part of your armies and part of your intelligence the agencies, you have to abide by these rules. But the fact of the matter is, it's very easy for a government to throw a little, you know, laundered money a black hat's way, right, and then claim disavowalment. I mean, did China attack Google or not? We still don't really know. Right. You can say, oh, it was definitely China, but you don't really know. And no government can go to China and throw some evidence down and, and make them answerable for what happened to Google because China's saying, we didn't do it. It, it was black hats. Right. And, they, and, and with the ability to spoof IPs and, and, and take command botnets, where are these attacks coming from? I... I don't think it's entirely useless to have this discussion, though, uh, whereas the U.K. was like, eh, we don't need to worry about it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the British government sources told the BBC, you know, we're not convinced of a need for a treaty about conflict in cyberspace. I, I, think, th I, think, I think the treaty should be uh, trans uh, t written up. I, I don't, I, I think, as Chris uh, mentioned, that it's, it's not... Uh, reasonable to think that everyone's going to be following the same rules but it's a good exercise for at least people to get on the same page as to how I think everyone it is affected it's, and yeah, worried it's something that needs to be said um but it's not something that's going to be followed hill holiday is a research firm who asked five bostonian families to cut their broadcast video and cable access over the Christmas break and replace it with the latest video on demand technology. And what they found was very interesting. It wasn't a problem getting the shows they wanted to watch, it was a problem picking the shows they wanted to watch. When they had the wealth of video on demand, which isn't even that wealthy, really, when you consider how many shows are missing from that, they couldn't decide. They just wanted to sit back and turn on the TV. Mm -hmm. They didn't want right. to have to. Pick. You know, I know a lot of people who uh, 
want to marry their DVRs go, what's wrong with these people? I mean, they just need a little bit more time. I can totally, totally empathize with this. I find when I uh, record shows to my DVR, I record fewer shows. I watch the shows less. I just... You know, I sometimes I watch my Comcast on demand offerings, even though they come out way up. I mean, I could have just recorded Thirty Rock, but I wait till it comes out on demand because it's it's as if I am so it's so ingrained in my mind that it's served up to me, mm -hmm. and it's sort of out of my control that I've had a really hard time uh, adapting to Taking the control. I choose right. what I watch when, and what happens is I watch less. I for me, I agree. It's you, Part of what TV, the TV experience is, is that you don't want to think. You want to sink down in your couch and just veg. And it's you can't do too. that when you're like, and especially when it's more than you, if you've got a spouse or people over. So what do you guys want to watch? That's an all night discussion at that point, you know, especially yeah. when you have that kind of selection. So for me with the DVR, like I record the, like I have all my shows that I record, but instead of like Monday nights being Chuck, it's really like Tuesday afternoons are Chuck for me, you know, I, but it's still the same schedule. I think the uh, the end result of this is that we're, it's not that we're not going to get Hulu's and Netflix's and video on demand solutions taking over, but they're going to have to develop a very good front end that people use to decide what to watch. And what gets featured on those front end is, is, is going to have an advantage over everything else. And, and it should be customized to the kind of things you like. Exactly. Right. I was going to say that because Netflix, I have to say I've become a huge Netflix person because I now I only have Netflix in my bedroom on the TV. I don't have a, an actual video box. And the suggestions for you are almost spot on. Like I've I've found and watched and loved so many things. So these these DVR companies that are going to do the on demand are going to have to start monitoring what you're watching. You're going to have to allow them to monitor that and they're going to have to start serving up what they think is going to be relevant to you and if they have the right algorithms for that then it's like you said it's going to it's going to change that frontier and make it more relevant than just here is everything in this whole library choose something. Yeah. And 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 going back to what you were saying about TiVo, the idea of having to pick stuff and record it goes away if you have that situation where everything is already recorded and and you've got some suggestions for you. Uh, and that's bad news for TiVo. They're trying to figure out how to squeeze every last cent out of their business model as possible. They've just launched a website uh, well a, a different part of their website at stopwatch.tivo.com called Ad Scorecard. Uh, where they're taking some of the data that they collect from people's TiVos and making it public to try to popularize the idea of, hey, advertisers, you can really find out how well your brand message is getting across by looking at our ad scorecard and signing up for the full package. You know, I went to this ad scorecard because I thought, well, this is really interesting information. I want to check this out. And there's a little bit less uh, information than I thought there would be. What they have, at least on their page right now, uh, is... Uh, a duel uh, between Burger King, uh, McDonald's, and Wendy's fast food restaurants. And <laughs> so, how many how many people actually watched the commercials for those three companies? Uh, how many people watched? So we've got Burger King at the top with a cap of 1.2 million. Uh, at least it's at some point, you know, in in the weeks that that they were following this, folks. This is broadcast, but. Here's my problem with this is that I'm looking at this. There, it's Burger a, King's it's a, winning huge. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, Burger King with that weird Big king that lays king in your bed. Guy, yeah. That's so creepy. Like, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. It's a terrible commercial. I'm not a big fan. I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and see that commercial. <laughs> but you think if you look at it and go, oh, well, yeah, I guess Burger King because they push the envelope a little bit more and maybe people like the commercials more. But then I think, you know, when I'm watching DVR material, and I know that a show is about to end, especially like some of my shows where they're for very formulaic, you know, and you've got the music swell and you're like, okay, commercial time. And you press fast forward and you know that you've got like one, two, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. Yeah, right. And then you stop fast forwarding and there's like one commercial left and you just go ahead and watch it because you know the show is about to come back. What if that's the Burger King commercial? So where a spot is in the commercial block is very important. Yeah, right. maybe Burger DVR King folks. just had better placement. Yeah. It's possible. All right, internet access was restored to Egypt earlier this week, uh, and here are here are three things that are happening. Uh, first of all, Twitter just got flooded 
with people uh, talking about their observations. Uh, so you can find out a little more about what's going on in Egypt from Twitter, although there's so much, it's a little confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, MSNBC has a really good story about how to try to make sense of it, how to pick the right people to follow. Also, trolls have pounced on the Egyptian Facebook pages. We talked a little bit earlier this week about text messages coming via Vodafone and Vodafone protesting from the government saying pro-Mubarak messages. Well, now pro-Mubarak accounts are trashing uh, the pages of Facebook protest groups. And hacktivists have targeted Egypt and also Yemen. There are protests beginning in Yemen as well. Uh, so groups like Anonymous are putting denial of service attacks not only against Egyptian sites uh, that are from the government, but also against Yemeni sites. I don't, I don't think that hacking Egyptian websites is really the best way to show your support for the Egyptian people. Um, but I do I do think that Egypt, the government of Egypt shutting down the internet, I halfway wonder if this isn't why they did that in the first place. Is because I think they were smart enough to realize that this information on Twitter was going to get out. But if it came out piecemeal throughout the entire thing, it would have been much easier to follow, much easier to get riled up about it, much easier to kind of garner support. As a massive data dump, as soon as they open the doors again, it is. It becomes useless. And I think that they have actually overcome the ability to say, like, you're not going to be able to stop this information. They didn't stop it, but they have made it extremely difficult to parse and make any sense of. Uh, the, uh, a very popular Facebook page, which at least takes quite a bit of credit for the organization of protests in Egypt, uh, we are all uh, Khalid Saeed, some uh, pro-Mubarak folks, or one has to assume that they are, have have been at least successful in confusing people. Um, it, one of the admins of this particular Facebook page has a certain icon, which was copied, and somebody else made an account with that exact same yeah. icon, and wrote on that page, which is a lot of people are flooding to that page to find out when's the next protest, where right. are we all going, what time does it start, saying, protest has been canceled, yeah, that's the latest. Now there's your conspiracy so theory. That, it mean, turned off the internet while they trained a few people to go do this. <laughs> I stuff. mean, this is the sort of thing where, I mean, it, it's it's very confusing, yeah, at the very least. It's sad. It, I mean, I think it speaks a lot to where we are um, as far as how the internet is shaping up these protests and shaping up the um, how the the because it, back in the days of Tiananmen Square, when China had their massive protests, we all saw bits and pieces of it on the news, but we certainly didn't have the idea of what was really going on over there. And now we have the ability to know exactly what's happening as it's happening, and it rallies that kind of support. And so these governments are afraid of that, and so they're going to do what they can to prevent that from happening. And it's sad to see that they're going to those kind of lengths because, you know, it's... We've Everybody got, we, wants their power. Yeah, we've got an interesting email on how to uh, use the Internet to organize even when there is no Internet. We'll get to that in a little bit. First of all, the news fuse. Google Chrome developers have announced the availability of a new version of Chrome 9 in the stable channel. Now it features support for WebGL and Chrome Instant features. If you want to try it out, download it from google.com slash chrome. The rest of you will have it automatically appear in Chrome sometime later this year. Last month, Facebook told developers they'd be able to get users' current address and mobile phone numbers, and then people freaked out. And so Facebook was like, okay, hold on. We'll put the plans on hold. We need to tweak the user control of this information. However, now U.S. representatives Edward Markey and Joe Barton have sent a letter to Facebook asking 11 very important questions about Facebook's plans for this policy. So Zuckerberg's homework is due to Congress on February 23rd. <laughs> That's kind of like your girlfriend's dad saying, what are your intentions My guess is that my this all just goes away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think, I, I, yeah, I think you know what? Right. Not worth it. Nintendo is working on Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo 3DS. During our conversation with developers of the original Super Mario Brothers, Nintendo game designer, you know him, Shigeru Miyamoto, revealed that he is working on a new Super Mario Brothers title for the 3DS, uh, which will take advantage of the ability to show 3D images without the glasses. So Mario will be leaping out of the screen at you. Woo -woo. Woo That's frightening. It's me, Mario, in your face. <laughs> in your face. Capcom is up to their old internet-based piracy control games again. This time they're at least warning people about it before they buy the game. So if you were so unlucky as to obtain a copy of Bionic Commando Rearmed 2, the game will authenticate itself with Capcom servers each time it launches. No internet, no plane. My recommendation, no buy. Yeah. Certainly not if you're in Egypt. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. 
I think that was the least of their worries, but <laughs> I get your point. The Associated Press Board of Directors today approved the formation of an independent entity called the News Licensing Group to track and police the online use of content from AP and its members and make sure those publishers get paid. A new company will build on the licensing, distribution, and tracking duties of AP's existing news registry and is expected to launch this summer. So if you quote AP in your blog post, expect the AP police at your door. Who is it? It's the AP. <laughs> We're here to waste our time and money. <laughs> but I only quoted one sentence. That'll be $200. <laughs> Back to Facebook. To make a point that putting trust in Facebook comes at a price, a media artist and media critic created a dating website, dating in quotes, where they placed 250,000 Facebook profiles without asking for any permission. <laughs> Facebook claims is this is a violation of our terms of service. <laughs> Although the critics only used public profile information, so is it really? Uh, these people have pranked Amazon and Google before in order to raise awareness about privacy. That's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like an alternative to Scroogle? Scroogle yeah. is one of those sites that allows you to search Google without being logged in, without having your data logged. Uh, say hello to startingpage.com. They claim to serve as a middleman between you and Google, and they keep no records or data of their own at all. So even if they were subpoenaed, they'd have none of your search data to hand over, and all Google would know is somebody made a search from starting page, but they wouldn't know who. So they say. That's what they say. Is there any way to prove that kind of stuff? Uh, yes. All right. If starting page will cooperate, there would be. <laughs> I bet they, and I bet they will. Yeah. A new open technology report card shows that only a third of federal agencies get a passing grade on open source usage and contribution. Contribution. <laughs> contribution. Contribution. Contribu contributing I do like contributions. That. Thank you. Thank you. And the rest fail while the Defense Department is leading the way of the federal agencies to get a passing grade. Savio Rodriguez explains what both government and business can learn from the DOD's open source prowess. Who knew the DOD? So open. Good job. So sourcey. Good on you, DOD. Yeah. All right. This Sunday is the Superb Owl. <laughs> right? Is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. The Superb... Uh, super, it's, superbal? Superbal. Superbally? Superbal. <laughs> anyway, so the this is Bowl. TNT's official Super Bowl coverage. 2011. Uh, the Green Bay Packers will win this, yep. according to the internet. <laughs> Apparently, whatever team got the most searches and chatter uh, before the Super Bowl has won the past four years. Oh. And uh, Infegi measures all of those billions of messages and articles, and they say Packers just barely have the edge on the Steelers. I love stats. I wish I was yeah. just like a random stats person. You know, the team that gets <laughs> the most internet chatter, at least for the last four years that I've been tracking it, wins. Yeah. So, I wonder how that affects Vegas. Therefore, though. the Packers are going to win. Do you know who actually wins every Super Bowl? The better team? The advertisers. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. Uh, because even when the, right. even though the ads actually suck now, and everyone's like, oh, I watched Super Bowl for the ads, and it's like there's two ads worth watching. Cat uh, herding was the best ad, and they've all everyone, been downhill since. Motorola says they've got a Super Bowl ad that uh, takes on Apple. It's got lots of people dressed up in, like, white cowls, wearing white iPhones, and then there's one guy with the Zoom, and he looks normal. So it's kind of a, you know... In your face, Steve Jobs. Oh, kind like of thing. you're all brainwashed, and I'm cool. And, and remember, there was the Apple 1984 right. ad from back Were in they, the yeah. 80s. So you've all become sheep. Yeah. These, Apple well, people. Yeah, these companies think that insulting the potential customer base is a good way to advertise, though. I mean, I would, as an Apple user, I'd be insulted by that ad. <laughs> so I do. Well, you know, I'm not. I a think that a lot of small I mean, KKK member. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's essentially what they look a, like. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah. I mean, I think that Apple folks would be more insulted because they're Apple folks. Right. Maybe Don't insult the device. Don't folks. insult the customers. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Like Verizon went towards AT&T. They were, they were on the side of the people saying, AT&T doesn't work. I can't make calls. But right. they didn't insult us. We exactly. have to use AT&T. Also, Audi says they are going to be the first to use a Twitter hashtag in an ad. Probably, uh, probably the first to use a Twitter hashtag in an ad. I don't it, know Audi. if that's for sure, but whatever. Knock yourself out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> on well, it's, it's not an easy to remember Twitter hashtag either. <laughs> so. On to the calendar. Oh, you guys, I wish we had a cake. We've got beer, though, so Yay, maybe, perhaps we, raise woo, glass. we raise should cheers to Facebook's seventh birthday. Chink, Happy chink, birthday, chink. Facebook. Salute. Hey.
Facebook. Uh, They're the age of reason now. It's, it's worth noting that uh, everyone Maybe goes, grow well, up. wait a second, I wasn't a Facebook <laughs> member seven years ago. It was Harvard only. That's right, when they Back launched. At, you know, it's its first birthday. Uh, it, was a, it was a walled garden, a different one anyway. Uh, also talking about Facebook, they're holding an event, a new Ooh, event, gosh. and this one is going to be... What's going to be the big announcement? Oh, it's, it's a big one. Is it going to be a Facebook phone? They're moving their headquarters. Oh. Yeah, Which they're actually... still not allowed to go to. Facebook has <laughs> decided to, uh, to, to have a big event uh, around uh, their new headquarters, which they're not saying, although is pretty much already been um, outed by the San Mateo County databases of... Uh, 312 and 314 Constitution Drive, which are neighbors oh, to the former Sun Campus, <laughs> nice. which everyone thought that they would be moving to anyway. So, what an event. It's also Becky Worley's birthday, uh, as Virgil re reminded Maybe me. Maybe that's what the event's Today. about. Happy that's birthday, Becky. Event. Happy birthday, Becky Worley. Absolutely. Yeah. She's also Absolutely seven. A calendar item. She's also seven. Yeah. <laughs> and her first year was spent at Harvard. Yeah. So, I mean, Actually, so she's many a Stanford similarities. Grad. Oh, sorry, Becky. Yeah. No, I won't make that mistake again. Green Poison has finally unleashed iOS 4.2.1. Just in time for iOS 4.3. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. I know. 4. Point, yeah. Isn't I'm that, actually already on It's coming out on the 13th, at least. Yeah. We hope so, anyway. So, well, all right. Anyway, jailbreak. If you break. don't want to upgrade, yeah. you've, you've got yeah. your uh, untethered jailbreak. A Grand Rapids Best Buy Facebook page says that February 24th is the day for the Motorola Zoom, and the 14th is the day for the HTC Thunderbolt. Um, this is just a particular store's Facebook page, so we're not really sure if they were supposed to say this. No, they weren't. They probably weren't. <laughs> they weren't. But the page is still up. Hey. So I either no one's paying I still attention think the or they Zoom don't care. is vaporware. It's never coming out. Oh, come on. Even with the Super Bowl ad? Yes. <laughs> the most expensive vaporware ever. Because I, exactly. I said it on Tom's Top 5, so I have to stick to that. Yeah, yes. well. Stick to your gun. I said that the iPhone on. wasn't coming out on Verizon. Biggest so. waste of money on a Super Bowl I said Bowl there wouldn't ever. be a white iPhone. Still isn't, but. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, the Palm Pre 2 may be launching on Verizon February 17th. That's the latest rumor. Uh, came uh, via an internal product page, a third-party retailer, so. But if you're Take the Palm Pre 2, wouldn't you feel like Verizon is just not giving you any love right now? Exactly. They're already having another, I mean, February, what, February 9th? Is there, there is... Well, Sprint. Oh, right. Well, oh, oh, you're talking about the WebOS devices yeah. thing. And maybe we'll hear about the Palm Pre 2 there, but it's mostly going to be tablets. Yeah. But it's like, if there's going to be a big event prior to February 17th, then why have a February... Well, because then it would start shipping. On February 7th. Maybe. Well, they just know that no one's going to come, so that's actually a day off for them. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> All right, on to the voicemails. 260-TNT-SHOW is the phone number, and uh, we got many emails and a few voicemails along this same idea, and, and we'll let this caller speak for all of you. Just listening to the Thursday TNT show where you were talking about the daily only updating once a day. Um, I was just curious how you thought the difference or what you thought the difference was between the daily updating the show once a day and TNT updating the tech news once a day. What's the difference? I don't understand. I don't know if just that's curious. I don't know if that's a baby or a parrot in the background <laughs> or a baby parrot. <laughs> but I'm a only trying impersonating a baby. Only trying to deflect you from the point <laughs> that you make. Which, let me let me tell you what the difference is. Here we very, go. It's very different. That's such belt. a John Stewart impersonation you're doing right now. <laughs> very good. Daily is is an iPad app. We're not. Rest my case. <laughs> Done. Uh, no. First of all, I mean, can, can I just point out that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The daily, no, you were defending the daily in prep today. The daily is well. I mean, I I I've thought about this a lot. It's it's uh, I I I understand what our caller's saying, but it is updated. I, I, I assume it's not going to be updated more than maybe four times on a really interesting news day. Right, and this is all right. sort of breaking news stuff. But it isn't just one edition that's released in the morning, and that's what you get. To its credit, they, I, they do claim that they'll be updating stuff. I would say that the difference between a podcast like Tech News Today or Buzz Out Loud or New Brew Thursday or, or any, any podcast is the form doesn't lend itself to continual updating. You make a file, you put it up for download, and you download it. You have to put up another file right. mm -hmm. to update it. Whereas the form in an iPad 
is lending itself to updating because it's constantly connected to the internet or most right. of the time. And so we have a, a, an expectation that when I pull up that New York Times app, when I pull up uh, that app from the Daily Beast, I am going to get fresh content. That doesn't mean, and, and I said this yesterday, that doesn't mean that the long form journalism that takes a long time to put out isn't valuable. But when you're calling yourself the daily, there's I get an expectation of of sort of like up to the minute stuff. But it, it is a point well taken. There is valuable there is value to be had from something that is updated only once a day. So maybe or I wouldn't have a job. If well, we if we say the Motorola Zoom is is coming out on a certain day and then we find out, well, that rumor was wrong, we'll just We'll just update Tom's voice. Like we'll do that Conan O'Brien effect right, where it's right. like, just kidding. Just kidding. Doesn't matter totally anymore. Not true. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, and I think, that, I think for me the difference is, is uh, the daily updates in the middle of the night so that it's there for you in the morning. So it is yesterday's news, whereas with Tech News Today, as I learned today, getting to watch you guys work, which is yeah, awesome. I, I can already it's, hear the emails. Yeah, well, I know. It's, I'm, I'm, I don't listen send to Send your know, emails to Stephen at NewBrewThursday.com. Thursday. Doesn't <laughs> download for me until Text the next morning. Yesterday. Yeah, well, that, and that's that's on you. If you're not watching it live, then that's on you. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys got the news from today. You're giving it to them right now. It's as up-to-date as it can be because... Pre, all the way up to pre-show, you're changing and altering and, and doing it versus something that updates at 3 in the morning. So that's I, I, the, the the observer from the outside. I do think I've been a little it. unduly harsh on the daily. I think it do, will have valuable content. I, yeah. I just I it, think it I don't does know that it's necessarily content. fulfilling the promise that a lot of people expect. Of, and maybe that's unfair to it. Maybe they're like, look, we're not trying to say... And they, and they are saying that. We're not trying to say we're up to the minute. We're saying it's valuable content. I think that they, they could solve this problem by just not calling it breaking news. It's like you can right. do everything on the daily that you want to do, and people will like the form factor and enjoy the experience, but breaking news doesn't work. It's an online newspaper at your front door when you get up for coffee, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's how they need to advertise it. On to the emails to TNT at twit.tv. Uh, Send IU, an ex sysop says... Don't know if it's because I'm old school or just old. Get off my lawn. But whenever I hear about someone shutting off the internet and then people not being able to communicate via their computers, one word comes to mind is FidoNet. <laughs> we were able to share messages, discussions, files, and email from all over the world. Just not as fast. BBSs may be dead, but not forgotten. I, I think this is an interesting point Never just forget. because they can shut off the internet, but they can't shut off phones. And so, well, they you, can shut off phones, but it's well, they a can, much but they bigger wouldn't. deal. Yeah. yeah, they wouldn't because then you're you're preventing 911 services and all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, I really think that you know that is going to be our like nuclear bomb shelter of the internet. Is that we'll all you go just back say to nuclear? He did. Nuclear. It's pronounced nuclear. It's a very it's a very common mistake. Yeah, Many true. presidents. Did have you ever made use it. FidoNet? When you um, were doing the BBS stuff, I have uh, I have I have recollections of FidoNet, but that wasn't. That wasn't wasn't a big big deal for you. No, I mean, I mean on the Commodore sixty four. God, I don't remember anything Fido being Net, specifically FidoNet. You just actually use your telephone to call into BBSs and then send messages from one BBS to the next. No, I didn't. And, do, and so I didn't, didn't do actually, that. I was aware of it. There was no I, internet yeah. necessary. It was before CompuServe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Next email comes from Ben. This is addressed to Tom. Tom. Not so quick on the Atrix. You missed the fine print on the pricing. It's 500 plus signing up for the 45 tethering plan. You aren't actually tethering though. And 300 or 500 for the empty shell is not a good price. Why not just buy a full laptop and use PDA net? The folks on every single Motorola Android forum are mad as hell. Ben, I have come down from my crack high from yesterday, and you're absolutely <laughs> right. I don't know what I was thinking. $500 for a dock is ridiculous, even yes. if I get the phone for free. Uh, I, I was just enamored by the idea. I love that dock. I love the idea of having the Atrix phone and being able to dock it, but... That price. Price. You know, when I was at CES. Price is, yeah, okay, yeah. let's say Atrix is $200, and I discount that because I get both for $500. It's still paying $300 for a dock. For a dock and yeah. I had to sign up for a $45 tethering plan I don't necessarily need. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. Tom, you're such a crackhead. <laughs> Web4811 in the chat room was like, yeah, Tom, I thought you were high. Yeah, I, I may have been. <laughs> but now, he, now he's just drunk, so he's, he's got I his head on straight. Now, now I'm sober. <laughs> nice. All right, uh, and, and, and speaking of uh, the beer that you brought to us, uh, yes. Darth Weef, Stephen Johnson, let yes. people know where they can find New Brew Thursday and the other stuff you do on the Internet. Oh, uh, newbrewthursday.com. 
uh, we release a weekly video, obviously on Thursdays, um, and uh, we just we're based the formats just three guys drinking beer and trying new stuff and having a good time. Three guys who know their beer too. Yeah, we, I, I you know we, we, to we, we like three to guys think that we know having a good time. Beer. Yeah, talking about beer and you know it's it's the greatest job in the world. I probably learned frankly. the most about beer ever. In all of last year, when I was on New Brew Thursday, <laughs> that's all. We had such a good time. Comic Con yeah. was awesome. That was fun. But I also do a whole bunch of uh, geek, geek stuff, a uh, Doctor Who podcast, and uh, geeks on PHP, and a few things. And you can find all of that at fortheloveofgeeks.com. That's where I kind of put everything. So. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. You can find us at twit.tv slash TNT. Give us a call, 260 TNT Show. Or you can email us. Our email address uh, is TNT, and then you use the at symbol. And then you add a TWIT dot TV. Oh, one of those end. TV. You, you, you put that in your email client. Uh, uh, and then that's you press, expensive domain. They're send. all fancy. Yeah, $40 yeah. a we're year. We're hoping Tuvalo doesn't sink or we're out of a domain name. See you later, folks. <laughs>